Income tax 2023-2024. Cost of goods sold and gross profit tax software example. Get ready and some coffee. Because if you're trying to tell the IRS auditor a joke about taxes, he won't depreciate it. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our CPA six-pack shirts, a must-have for any pool or beach time. Mixing money with muscle, always sure to attract attention. Yeah, even if you're not a CPA, you need this shirt. So you can like pull in that iconic CPA six pack stomach muscle vibe, man. You know, that CPA six pack everyone envisions in their mind when they think CPA. Yeah, as a CPA, I actually and unusually don't have tremendous abs. However, I was blessed with a whole lot of belly hair. Yeah, allowing me to sculpt the hair into a nice CPA six pack like shape which is highly attractive. Yeah, may maybe the shirt will help you generate some belly hair too. And if it does, make sure to let me know. Maybe I'll try wearing it on my head. A and yes, I know six pack isn't spelled right, but three letters is more efficient than four. So I trimmed it down a bit, okay? It's an improvement. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in our form 1040 example problem using Lacert tax software. You don't need tax software to follow along, but if you have access to software, great tool to run scenarios with. You can also get access to forms, schedules, instructions at the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Standard starting point where we have Adam Taxman just trying to avoid a dang tax man living in Beverly Hills 90210 single filer. We have the schedule C income of 100,000 rolling into line eight. Let's follow that income by going to the schedule C, which is the profit or loss from business, having an income statement format income currently at the 120,000 expenses or business deductions at the 20,000 resulting in, in essence, net income of the 100,000, which is then rolling into schedule one called additional income adjustments to income part one additional income line three business income or loss from the schedule c that is ultimately rolling into the form 1040 line number eight additional income from schedule one if we go back to the schedule c we can see that the net income of the 100,000 also flows into the schedule se self-employment tax where we have social security and medicare taxes calculated on line 12 14 129 that flows into the schedule 2 called additional taxes part 2 other taxes line 4 self-employment tax 14 129 which ultimately rolls into the form 1040 page number 2 and line 23 14 129 also if we look at that Schedule C, the bottom line of the 100,000 rolling into the Schedule SE self-employment tax, where we just calculated that 14,129. If we take half of that here, 7,065, we can deduct that as an above the line deduction or adjustment to income on the Schedule 1, additional income and adjustments to income, page number two, which is adjustments to income, part number two, line 15, deductible part of self-employment tax from the Schedule SE 7065, which rolls into the form 1040 on line 10, adjustments to income. So the 100,000 minus the adjustments to income, 92,935. We've got the standard deduction here of the 13,850. We're letting the, the calculation of the software calculate the qualified income deduction from uh, form 8995. And we have a subtotal giving us finally line 15 taxable income, 63,268. Page number two, calculating the tax, federal income tax, 
uh, using the ordinary income or progressive rates, 9228 And then, of course, here's that 14129 from the self-employment tax, Social Security and Medicare, giving us the 23357 All right. So, of course, we're now focused on the Schedule C. Back to page number one. We're looking at this Schedule C income, which is pulling in from the Schedule C, profit or loss from business. Our primary focus now being on the cost of goods sold calculation, which is here on line number four. And then also basically uh, the gross profit uh, calculation that we have here. So note that in practice, you will usually, if you have inventory, have to have some kind of system to track the inventory. You might be using a periodic inventory system where you tie into a physical count, but you're not going to be doing a periodic inventory system on a yearly basis, typically. You're going to do it on a, on a daily basis, weekly basis, monthly basis, quarterly basis, possibly, or something like that, typically. Or you might be using a perpetual inventory system, in which case you are tracking uh, the, the cost of goods sold calculation as you sell the inventory and the inventory tracking as you sell it. So the reason I say that is because when you get the income statement as, say, a tax preparer, we're going to see a cost of goods sold number. I will already have the cost of goods sold number. So once again, let's imagine the cost of goods sold number in our income statement. If I go back into our Schedule C is, let's say, uh, the cost of goods sold, where would I put it? here, right? I'm going to imagine that I'm just going to put it into cost of uh, purchases. And let's say it was 20,000. So 20,000. Well, let's make it let's make it 10. Now let's make it <laughs> sorry, 30,000. Let's say the cost of goods sold was 30,000. If I go back to the forms, then it populates here. So that's what I want to be populating here. But I also need the supporting schedule on page number two, which has the cost of goods sold calculation. The reason this cost of goods sold calculation is confusing to people is because it's, it's a, basically on a periodic inventory system for the entire year, which isn't the actual cost of goods sold system or inventory tracking method that anybody is going to use because the tracking method you're going to use is either a perpetual inventory system or a periodic inventory system, not on a yearly basis, but rather on a weekly or monthly basis or something like that. So why, why does the government have this? Why do we have this page? Uh, because they want to see, in essence, a reconciliation of inventory. The point is, this is a balance sheet account of inventory at the beginning of the year, and then you have to give them inventory at the end of the year. That gives them a, a double check and reconciliation of a balance sheet type of account, even though there is no balance sheet on a Schedule C type of business. We see that we have components of balance sheets with this cost of goods sold calculation and with, for example, when we put property, plants, and equipment on the books and depreciate it, resulting in us having depreciation schedules. So what if I had a beginning balance here that would have rolled in from the prior software? So if I'm saying, okay, my current income statement that I have has 30,000 in it, but if I just plug that into purchases, maybe that doesn't work because I already had 10,000 that rolled in in beginning inventory. So if I just put 30,000 in purchases, I'm going to end up with 40,000 and that's going to throw off my calculation. The first thing you're going to want to do from a logistical standpoint, this is what I would typically do at least, is try to get this income statement properly input matching my data input form my income statement so i'm not going to first worry about the details of the cost of goods sold calculation you could do that first but i'm just going to say i'm going to make that thirty thousand, and then i'm going to go back and fix it so how can i make that to be thirty thousand? well i can go back on over here and say i'm not going to mess up the beginning inventory i'll just assume that the ending inventory is the same and that will give me the ability for it to just be 30,000. That allows me to do the rest of the data input while still being able to reconcile my net income to my income statement, and then recognizing that I need to go back to this number to double check and fix the cost of goods sold calculation so that I can get this basically periodic calculation for the IRS that they want to see. So we touched on this last time, 
But just logistically, let's look at it in a little bit more detail. We didn't do it last time. We, d we did it in a prior presentation. But let's look at it in a little bit more detail. If I go to Excel over here, here's my cost of goods sold formula. Beginning inventory plus purchases, cost of labor, materials, other. These three are if you're a manufacturing company. If you don't manufacture things, you're not going to have them. You can have a more simplified formula. If I add these lines up, that gives us our goods available sale for sale and then our inventory at the end of the year cost of goods sold. So let's do this just in Excel and just mirror this standard kind of cost of goods sold calculation. So we've got first, I'm going to abbreviate beginning inventory, inventory and so let's imagine that we we have that number now where would we get that number we would get it from the prior year ending inventory number on the tax return last year's ending inventory should be the current year's beginning inventory unless something funny is going on so we said that was ten thousand, i believe and then i'm going to say that we have then purchases and let's just deal with with a non-manufacturing company for now so purchases now the purchases, I'll have that information and I might maybe if I have a QuickBooks software, I can look up the purchases and, and run a report on it. But for now, I'm gonna say I don't easily see purchases on my financial statements because all I see on the balance sheet is my ending inventory and I can get the beginning inventory. And all I see on the income statement is the cost of goods sold. So I'd have to run some funny report like a purchases report to get that number. But I, I do know that if I look at the sum of those, I get the goods av available, available for sale, cost of goods available for sale, which I probably spelled wrong, which would be this plus this. And then I have the ending inventory which I know the ending inventory because it's going to be on the balance sheet. So let's imagine that the ending inventory, if I looked it up on the balance sheet, was, uh, let's say, 15000 Okay, so that's going to give us our cost of goods sold. Now, again, even though the cost of goods sold is the bottom line number, I probably already have it in my accounting system because that's what would be on the income statement according to my normal accounting method for inventory, which might be like a first in, first out, last in, first out, perpetual or periodic inventory system, whatever we're using. So I probably have that on my income statement already. Therefore, I'm backing into this number. If I abbreviate this formula, I can say this is going to be beginning inventory plus purchases, which is going to be, of course, X. And that's going to give us, and then I'm, I'm not going to give the subtotal. I'm just going to say less ending inventory is going to give me the cost of goods sold cost of goods sold so beginning inventory plus purchases gives me the cost of goods sold if i write that out formulaically we're going to say this is going to be beginning inventory of ten thousand plus the x which is the missing number minus the ending inventory 15 thousand is going to be equal to cost of goods sold 30 thousand and then we can basically uh, solve for x here which is going to be the 30 thousand i need to then subtract the 10 thousand from both sides minus the 10 thousand i need to add the 15 thousand to both sides plus the 15 thousand that's going to give us our 35 thousand so this should be 35 thousand let's see if we plug that in here and just double check it this and this, and then this is gonna be this, and the cost of goods sold is gonna be equal to beginning inventory plus purchases minus the inventory, the ending inventory. This has an added zero on it. 35,000 gives us our 30,000. So that's probably what you're likely to have to do basically in practice, because again, the, the IRS isn't making you do this to, to already calculate your cost of goods sold again because you've probably already done that using some kind of flow assumption depending on your accounting system what you need to do now is do it put your information into a reconciliation format for inventory which is basically the cost of goods sold calculation for a periodic system for the entire year 
And that's kind of the idea. Now, if you are a manufacturer, then it's going to be a little bit more complex because you're going to have to deal with the fact that you have not only just purchases, but cost of labor, materials, and other costs. Now, again, these are probably things that, that you're obviously going to be tracking, hopefully, in your accounting system so that you're already accounting for uh, your inventory. And you might have to do a, a similar kind of thought processes to think about, okay, what do I have in my system for the cost for the inventory of finished goods inventory, work and process inventory, and then raw materials. Because what happens in a manufacturing company is you buy the raw materials. So you're probably gonna have uh, the raw materials and the supplies here. And then you're going to add to those materials uh, labor and you're gonna be adding overhead head, and that's gonna increase those are the other components that add to the cost of goods sold to convert it from raw materials to the work in process to the finished goods. That whole cycle is basically part of uh, the inventory process. And then when you sell the inventory, it's going to be the the ending inventory calculation that is going to that that's going to be sold from right. You're going to be selling it, converting it from ending inventory to cost of goods sold. So what, you're going to have to think a little bit more about how, what your flow assumptions are in terms of the calculation of that so you can fill out uh, your schedule here. So in other words, the general idea would be that the cost of goods sold that comes out of your bookkeeping system would include the ending inventory that you sold and the inventory is made up of the materials uh, the labor that was going into it as well as the overhead. So you could do a similar kind of calculation here backing into a number of the of which would be similar to the purchases, which would be the, the cost of the goods that basically uh, you manufactured. And then you'd have to go back into the detail of that number to figure out the breakout of the uh, purchases versus the labor and the materials. And, and then you can depending on your accounting system, dig into those details, possibly looking at uh, the purchases. And you can track that with a similar kind of cost of goods sold uh, calculation, as well as well as the materials possibly. So those are just some ideas to kind of tr dig back down into those numbers, which again, gets more complicated when we're talking about manufacturing type companies. But let's go back on over here now. And let's just enter this into our system. So what did we say? We said that the cost of goods sold calculation then is, we said purchases are now 35,000. And we said that the ending uh, inventory was 15,000. So if I go back on over, then I still get to the bottom line of 30,000, which has to tie into page one. And if I go through each of these line items, then the beginning inventory this number needs to match what was on the prior year's tax return. If it doesn't, it's a red flag to the to the IRS. So you want to make sure that that ties into the prior year. And unless you have a rationale for why it doesn't, then tell the IRS why it doesn't. Purchase less cost of items uh, withdrawn for per personal use. So now we've got our purchases and then we have the cost of labor. Once again, this would be a cost calculation if you're dealing with a manufacturing company, but not with a company that just buys and mark up inventory, manufacturing becomes more complex where you want to make sure that you have some your proper accounting method applied for it. Same with materials and supplies and other costs could be overhead. Then if we add these up, this is going to be the goods that are available for sale that we could have sold. Uh, and then this is going to be the inventory at the end of the year, the stuff that we did not yet sell. So if this was stuff we had available for sale, and this is the stuff that's still on the books, that's going to give us our cost of goods sold. Now also note that this ending inventory number is another thing that the IRS might, you know, come and audit you on or want more detail if they were to audit you on. So then you want to make sure that you have the valuation, possibly a physical account and a calculation or of how you value that ending inventory. You might be using a period, a perpetual, inventory system. So you might just say, well, my software said that's what it was. 
but you should also still do a physical count even if you're using a perpetual inventory system and kind of verify that number as well as see if there's any shrinkage or something that you need to be accounting for. So in any case, that 30,000 is what's gonna be tying in to the first page and it's gotta tie in because if it doesn't, then you're not gonna come up with a net income that matches the income statement that you're trying to do data input for into the system. Okay, some more kind of unusual situations, just some of this is kind of from a bookkeeping standpoint. You, might, you have that situation where you could have donated inventory. Now, if you, if you donated inventory in basically our scenario here, so if we donated inventory to charity, then we might ask ourselves, well, what would that look like just from a bookkeeping standpoint? And one thing we might come up with just to record the transaction would be to treat it as a sale, but rather than selling it for the sales price, we sold it for $0. So normally the journal entry, if we sold inventory, would look something like this. In other words, we would get cash or accounts receivable. And in this case, we didn't get any, so that's gonna be zero. The other side would be sales. And again, we don't have any sales. And then the other side of the transaction would be cost of goods sold, the expense of the inventory. Let's, sold, we, let's say that we sold inventory for $400. That would typically have to be at cost now and then the inventory in inventory would go down by $400. So if you recorded it this way, then note when you do the charitable donation, you might end up having to donate it at cost rather than the retail price uh, because that's the, the general idea of it. And then the question is, should I be recording the other side to cost a good sold, which I typically would want to do because that's the account that I use in order to decrease the inventory. There should be a relationship between those two accounts. So you might, in other words, you might say, well, this account should be going to a charitable expense or something like that, uh, or possibly even to draws to then take the charity on the personal side of things. But again, we would kind of like to take the uh, expense as cost of goods sold, typically, you would think. So we have the similar relationship between our inventory and the cost of goods sold account. So that, and so if you did it this way, you would think that you would get the expense possibly if it's allowed, but not in the form of charitable expense or something like that, but instead in the form of uh, the cost of goods sold. Now, what if then you had the beginning inventory and no purchases in the current year and then you donated some of that inventory that was in the beginning balance of inventory. That's when you run into kind of this messy situation where the, where the IRS is saying, we might want you then to adjust this beginning inventory uh, to account for the donation. So just be aware of that little kink in the system. So in other words, in that case, you might actually have to lower the beginning inventory and possibly record the other side instead of the cost of goods sold to, to the charitable contribution expense or something like that. So you wanna kind of be aware of that little uh, exception uh, if you have the donation of the inventory. Just be careful with donations of the inventory because it's likely that when people donate inventory, they're gonna to wanna to get a benefit from the donation in the form of the sales price which isn't typically the case because you're typically gonna have the donation on uh, the cost. So if you could sell the inventory and then donate it, you know, you could think that that might be a, a way to go sometimes as well. So that's a, the general idea there. Obviously, if you adjust the beginning balance and it no longer matches last year's ending balance, then you wanna give the reconciliation to the IRS so you could tell them why that would be the case. And in most cases, hopefully you don't have to do that and the beginning balance will tie in so you don't have any problems with that. Now, the next thing, just from a bookkeeping standpoint, you might have uh, two types of discounts. Sometimes you're gonna have the, just the, like a trade discount, like a sales price versus like a cash discounts, which are usually smaller. So if you have a trade discount, like they give you 15% off of the inventory, then we could say, well, if the, if the inventory inventory sticker price is $100, but we sold, we gave you a 15% discount, 0.15, and it's a trade discount, this is this times this, then of course, we're gonna get the inventory for $85.
Now, obviously, just from a bookkeeping standpoint, you're going to record that on the books at the amount that you purchased it for, not the sticker price typically. And that's, of course, going to then be reflected in your cost to goods sold calculation. So when you buy the inventory, it'll most likely already be on the books for the $85, not the, the $100. And the other side would have to go to cash or however you paid for it. And so that would basically be logistically how that would work. Now, if you have a cash discount, then the discount's usually a lot smaller. Like, like let's say it's 0.0, uh, point, uh, point 0.01 or something like that, 1% uh, discount. Then you've got like a $1 discount. Well, sometimes you might take advantage of that discount and sometimes you may not take advantage of that discount. So it's possibly when you buy the inventory, maybe you buy in the inventory at the 100 and maybe it's then going into accounts payable of the $100. And then if you pay that $100 in 30 days, then you're going to pay the full price of the 100. But if you pay it within 10 days, then you get this 1% discount. So then I could say, well, if I pay it, then within 10 days, I'm going to have then the, 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 uh, the accounts payable is going to be at the 99 now that I'm going to pay down. And then the other side is going to be going to the, let's say, cash of 99. I've got this $1 that is still in the accounts payable because I only had to pay them $99. And then the question is, well, what do I do with that, that other dollar from a bookkeeping standpoint? Well, you could, uh, you could adjust the inventory so that the inventory is no longer on the books for $100, but is on the books for the $99. That's what you would think you would do because that's what we do with normal discounts. But that might mess up my whole flow assumption because I've already got this $100 on the books and then I have to account for it using first in, first out or last in, first out, perpetual periodic inventory system, whatever I'm doing. And if I don't always take that cash discount, it's gonna mess up my whole flow assumption. So then you might say, well, maybe I'll just, I'll just put those little discounts into another account so that, so that it doesn't mess up my normal kind of purchasing process. So then I'm going to have to say that, so the accounts payable is also going to be going down by that other dollar. And then I'm going to have something like uh, cash uh, discount income or something like that for the 100. The bottom line is then if you did it this way, then you're, you're not reflecting this amount in the inventory and therefore the cost of goods sold when you sell it, but you still are recording in essence uh, the income. It's just, this is gonna be income that's gonna be recorded elsewhere. So, you, so just depending on your, again, that's kind of a bookkeeping decision as to how you want to deal with those cash discounts. If you have any cash discounts, right? You might not always have cash discounts. Now, the other thing is returns and allowances. So you can see in our calculation here, uh, we also have the returns and allowances. And those are gonna be things that we could call the uh, contra revenue accounts. So in other words, if we think about like an income statement, we're typically gonna have, uh, you, you could say income, right? In our case was one, 120,000 minus the expenses of 20,000. But then we did a subcalculation for the cost of goods sold, which is going to be a special expense if, and so this and this would be net income, right? But but income. But you can break out into a multiple step income statement, which would look more something like this. We would say we would say this is going to be let's call it revenue this time, which I spelled wrong, and that's going to be internally. Let's say we had one hundred and we had uh, sales of 125,000 and then there were returns and allowances, right? So they returned merchandised returns that, so instead of reducing sales, which I don't typically want to do, I'm gonna record it in a different account called returns and allowances or something like that, giving us the net sales account, which I'll put in the outside now, which is gonna be this, minus this. So now we're at uh, the 120,000 and then minus the cost of goods sold, goods sold that we calculated, 
which we said was 30,000 based on that other calculation and then and so that's going to be our gross profit which is now going to be 120 minus the 30 and then all other expenses and let's say that that those were you know 10,000 and that's going to give us to our net income income to do this minus this so we have some terms that can kind of confuse people so so one is going to be this net sales sounds like net income but no it's just sales after the contra account of returns and allowances the gross profit seems like well what even is gross profit well that's just basically a subtotal after cost of goods sold as we go from income down we're always going down revenue minus this this is acting kind of like an expense even though it's like a contra revenue account minus the cost of goods sold which is a very important expense which gives us to a separate subtotal gross profit which i spelled wrong and then minus all the other expenses gets us to the net income not nets net income that's going to be uh the, the 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 general idea now obviously if we have returns and allowances then what happened is we had a sale so let's say we we had a sale just from a bookkeeping standpoint let's say we had uh, a sale so we had cash that we received for 100 dollars, and then we had the sales which is revenue of 100 and then we had the cost of goods sold which let's say that that was 75 dollars, and then inventory inventory went down by 75 that's the normal calculation 100 minus 75 is the impact of 25 on net income and then if they return the inventory then we basically reverse that right so then i'm going to say i'm just going to reverse it directly if they return the inventory then i'm going to have to say okay sales should go down now which well let's do it this way cash is going to go down with a credit and then sales should go down with a debit and then cost of goods sold should go down with a credit and inventory should go down with a debit <clears throat> which would be the general because we would just reverse it if they returned it but i don't want to reverse out the sales number here because sales usually never goes down so instead of reducing the sales number we're going to put it into returns returns and allowances that's why we end up with this contra account of returns and allowances here that's just from a bookkeeping standpoint so obviously in our calculation of the cost to get sold uh, or in our our income statement the returns and the allowances 120,000 minus the returns if there were any let's say we had three thousand of returns is going to get us then to the 117 now which is basically net sales then we'll subtract out the cost of goods sold which is basically an expense but isn't in the expense section rather up top because it's so important which is going to get us to the gross profit okay so next thing that could happen just from a bookkeeping standpoint is you might take inventory out for your own personal use right so now you're going to say okay i had my inventory here and now i'm using it myself well when i put the inventory on the books then what happened we had when we put it on the books we're going to say that we had the inventory is going on the books for uh for let's say a thousand dollars this time and then we had uh cash that we paid for it of the thousand dollars and then we're going to sell that inventory but we then dipped into it we dipped into our own stash right and we took it out ourselves well that that means that when we when we take it out what would you do from a bookkeeping standpoint typically you would have to record draws of whatever we took out let's say we took out 300 of our own inventory and then we're going to say the other side is is going to have to decrease the inventory would be the general idea now again you don't typically want to do that you'd like to when you purchase something allocate out at the beginning what what's going to be draws the other way you can 
do this transaction to say, well, if I bought the inventory and part of it's for myself, inventory is going to be then, uh, let's say, draws and then let's say cash. So cash is going out for 1000. I'm going to take myself 300, which leaves inventory at the, the 700, right? The, these two are going to get you to the same point at the end of the day of the inventory minus uh, the, 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 well, plus this inventory is going to be the 700. So the, so the basic idea here is if you're dip, if you dip into your own inventory, then you got to make sure that you record it as a draw, noting that the draw is not an income statement account. It's not going to show up on the income statement. It's going to be on the balance sheet if you use something like <clears throat> QuickBooks. <clears throat> and then, and that's the point because it's kind of like, a, it would be like, like a, a withdrawal, like as if you took the money, as if you took money out of the business, similar uh, kind of thing. If you don't draw it out, then what's going to end up happening, your inventory is going to obviously be uh, overstated. And then what's going to happen when you count your inventory at the end of the year, you do the physical count, you're going to then uh, record the cost of goods sold calculation, and you're going to record it instead of to draws to cost of goods sold, which is what the IRS is going to be very skeptical of, because if you record it to cost of goods sold, that means you're taking an expense, which is a business deduction. And that would mean you're overstating your deductions, and that's going to get you in trouble possibly. Another thing that often confuses people just from a, like a logistical standpoint is that is the freight uh, and stuff that you're, when you purchase something. So, so in other words, if you bought inventory, let's say for a thousand dollars and you're paying a thousand dollars for it, uh, then you have to pay separately the shipping to get the inventory. So then you might think, well, I should then say it's going to be shipping expense of whatever fifty dollars and then the cash is going out for the 50. but that shipping that you're paying for to get the inventory to you uh, may have to be included in basically the capitalization of the inventory because the only reason you're paying the shipping is to get the inventory so from a logistical standpoint how to exactly do you do that how are you going to include that in your flow assumptions for the cost of the inventory and so on, because you might be paying two different people for the cost of shipping. But from just an accounting standpoint, that would typically be the way we would think of it because uh, you have your, whatever you're paying for to get the inventory to a point where it's gonna be sold is part of the cost of inventory, therefore should be capitalized and then expensed, not at shipping expense when you pay for it, but rather when you actually sell the inventory in the form of cost of goods sold. Okay, so given that, obviously our calculation over here is gonna be the gross profit minus the returns and allowances, if you have any, you would only have that if you basically generally like sold inventory or had to return services or something, gives us basically net sales and then cost of goods sold, which you would only have if you sell inventory. If you're a service company, you wouldn't have any cost of goods sold is going to give you uh, the gross profit. And then they threw in this other income, including federal and state gasoline and fuel tax credits and so on up here. And then that's gonna give us to our, uh, our gross income, which you might call like gross profit. And then we're gonna subtract out all the other expenses to get us basically down to uh, the net income is going to be the general idea. Now, one other thing just to point out that we could see this from a logistical standpoint for helping us to track inventory. And you can also think of it as a red flag kind of calculator, a statistical analysis kind of calculation that the IRS might use to see if they're going to, if they want to audit something, if they, if they're, or if they are auditing something. So, no, and, and that would be like, for example, I can look at this comparison between my, my, uh, growth for my, for my gross profit and then this cost of goods sold calculation here, for example. Well, actually, let's think of it down here. Let's, let's say my, my calculation for gross profit, let's say, is just going to be sales. And let's say I have units that I sold that are $100. 
So I sell them for $100. Let's say they cost me, they cost me the $75. Uh, let's put an underline here. That's gonna mean my, my gross profit per unit is gonna be equal to 100 minus 75. Now, if I look at the percentages then, I can say, well, if I take equals this 25 divided by the 100, 25% is my percent gross profit. If I take the 75 divided by 100, that's going to give me the allocation that's going to the cost of goods sold. Now, if I sold all of these units, then let's say I, I sold, you know, uh, 43 of them, right? Then you would think that this same thing would, would basically form out this way. So it'd be 4,300 and the cost of each of them, if they were all the same, would be the cost and which would be this times this. And that means my gross profit would be this minus this. I should get then this amount is what we would imagine is on our, our books for taxes, right? So the IRS is then going to take this and say, well, what if I take this divided by this, that's going to give us our 25%. Is that markup, does that line up with your normal unit by unit markup, right? That's going to be the question. Now we can ask that question internally because we might be using like a, like a perpetual inventory system, a periodic inventory system where we have to rely on the physical count to figure the cost of goods sold, possibly nightly, weekly, or monthly. And in that case, we might say, well, I ha how do I account for shortage or shrinkage or theft? Well, you can do a calculation like this to say, is my aggregate coming out with a ratio that is similar to what my gross profit calculation is on a per unit basis? If it's not, then, then something might be happening. There might be theft or something that, or shrinkage that is happening. And then from the IRS's perspective, they might say, is this gross profit percentage normal for the industry that you're in. If it's not, then the IRS might use that as a, as a reason or a rationale for further questions would be the general idea. Notice that this is just a, a, a convention. It's not going to work all the time because you might sell multiple products, which might have vastly different profit margins, right? So if you sell multiple products, you might try to shoot for like a profit margin of 25% all the time, but maybe you have different, you know, widely different profit margins based on different types of sales that you have, which is going to complicate this calculation. So it's just like a ratio analysis technique that you can kind of look at to see the reasonableness of uh, your, your, your gross profit calculations.